signage all around. I hope that you found it helpful. It's often struck me, even going back to the days that I was here as a student, that Underline has some wonderful paths and roads, but it wasn't always the easiest place to navigate. When you would come in off of Route 176, the first thing you would reach is a fork in the road, and I used to call this the Fork of Doom. <laughs> because you would have to flip the point, and you would either go to the left, towards the buildings you were undoubtedly looking for, or you would head off on a journey into the woods. And you'd be wondering, if I just go another 20 yards, maybe, I'll reach the buildings. And you'd go on and on and on the way. But if you chose correctly, you'd go a little ways, across the bridge, you'd reach another fork. They used to call this the fork of no return. <laughs> because you flip your coin again, and you would either go to the left and reach the buildings you were seeking, or you'd go to the right and eventually go down a steep hill and you wind up under a dark tunnel. And if you glimpsed high, you could just see the spire of the main chapel. You feel a little like Dante at the beginning of the inferno, where you could see the mountaintop you wanted to reach, but you had no idea how to get there. All the roads do lead to where you intend to go. But a good road, like a good gate, is almost useless unless you know how to find it. I am the gate, Jesus says. I am the gate. Go to me and find the pastors. I'll keep out what can be harmful. Wonderful image. I am the gate. What's not so easy, though, is finding the gate. Especially maybe in this Easter season, it's so easy to know, to talk about, and to sing about, and to pray about what the gate looks like. It's a glorious gate. It's wonderful. Jesus Christ himself. But I think one of the seductions of the Easter season is that while we describe that gate so accurately, we kid ourselves a lot of the time thinking that we really know how to find it. If that gate is a gate of compassion, wonderful. But the gate to compassion isn't necessarily found in a beautiful place like this. The gate to compassion swings into crowded camps, swings into millions of faces displaced and wondering where their next meal is going to come from. That gate can be described, perhaps, but it's not so easily found. If the gate is peace or justice, easily described, but it doesn't swing necessarily on idyllic bronze like these, swings into places where there is terrible violence, where hundreds of lives are taken every year. It swings into less beautiful places of Chicago land than this. It swings in less beautiful places of Seattle, or Des Moines, or Grand Rapids, or any of the dioceses who send men here to underline than this. The gate of justice and peace is described and not so easily found. If the gate is a gate of forgiveness, wonderful, beautiful, you can describe it well. But it probably doesn't swing here. There's a good chance that you and I didn't come to this Mass bringing along the person we most desperately need to forgive in our lives. The person who is so difficult, not simply to be with, but to even look in the eye. That's where the gate of forgiveness is. Easily described, but not so easily found. And so I think it's a wonderful blessing that in the face of that challenge, we have a great hope. And it's always the case that the Easter season slides right into this month of May, Mary's month. Because while Mary has many amazing qualities, I'd like to think that one of her greatest is she points the way to the gate. She says, with real beacon light, here, this way, here's the way you have to go. You can describe it, know what it 
looks like, but you don't always know how to get there, so follow me. And I don't mean that it's just some sort of nice pie in the sky saying. In real brass tacks, rubber hits the road kind of ways. If you look at Mary's life in scripture, she does that. She points the way to the gate. Think about how many times she sits in the front of confusion and uncertainty. Right at the very beginning of the Annunciation. I don't know how this is going to happen. I want you to know that I don't know, she boldly says here. But she stays there. When her son is lost in the temple, she finds him, and he gives her a rather perplexing answer. She doesn't run away in the face of confusion. Maybe she knows she's in front of the gate, and maybe it's a gate that she doesn't fully have figured out yet. But she stays there. Now just imagine the people in her life at the time, the questions they must have had, how easy it would be for them to turn away and look somewhere else. And maybe they didn't have this Jesus all figured out, but they trusted her, they knew her, and there was something in her quiet strength that allowed them to find the gate. And think about Mary's ability to say, this is the gate, and if this is the gate, then you should listen to what the gate says. It's all well and good for sheep to follow the voice of the shepherd, but first they have to learn what that voice sounds like. You and I hear the voice all the time, right? We hear it in wonderful talks, homilies, we hear it from the Holy Father, we hear it from one another. It's one thing to hear the voice, it's another thing to recognize it and say, I'm going to follow. How easy it is to say, what? Isn't that wonderful? Hope is challenging us, we should be a field hospital, we should go out to the margins. That's what the gate looks like. How easy to read some of the beautiful encyclicals of Pope Benedict, John Paul II, or whomever, your favorite saint. That's what the gate looks like what the voice sounds like, but why do we struggle to recognize it? Once again, Mary has it very simple. Just hear his words and do what he tells you. And much more often than not, our church is a good guide. Imperfectly by human means, but led by a wonderful and holy spirit. And how easy it is to say at different times, no, no, that couldn't be the voice. Couldn't be the voice. I'm, I'm listening to someone else. And Mary simply says, you may not now understand what this is all about, but trust that much more often than not, it's a voice that is inspired by the Holy Spirit. So listen to it. And before you or I decide that it's probably wrong, to really sit with it patiently, Try to follow it in faith. And lastly, the most important gate is perhaps the most difficult to recognize and find our way to. Because the cross itself is a gate. And for most of us, it's a stone wall. For most of us, we're convinced the gate must be somewhere else in this imposing wall. It couldn't possibly be here. This couldn't possibly be the way into peace. This couldn't possibly be the way into enduring love. And Mary sits there, at the very foot of that gate, looking up. And all we have to do is follow the eyes. I wish I could say that's where my eyes are. Lots of times they turn away, but Mary doesn't leave. And when those moments come that I'm able to search again, there she is. Here's the gate you need. Pass through here. Every one of us in this room, in our own way, has that frightening cross to confront. And the temptation is simply to say, there's no way this is the gate into what the shepherd promises. And Mary says, stay. And sometimes when we just can't find the courage, when we don't know how in the world we're ever going to stay there, the hospital room, the difficult marriage, at the time that we're struggling to figure out whether the choice we made is the right one or not. Beautiful prayers to sit with them. Don't have to be 
sight of anything, but just to sit with her and contemplate her at the foot of the gate and watch her gaze. So at the end of this beautiful liturgy, we'll all process out, we'll head over to the beautiful garden, Mary's beautiful statue will be crowned. It's easy to be there. It's a beautiful statue, it's a beautiful morning. It's easy to say, this is the one who leads us to the gate. But really, we make a big mistake if we just sing our hymns and crown Mary and go our way. Look at her hands. She's going to be holding something very precious, but it's something precious in addition to what we expect to find in her arms. She's also going to be holding a map. It's going to say, go this way. When you leave the beautiful liturgy, go this way. Yes, you sang about the gate, but here's where your gate lies. You need to follow this road. She has a map that's as unique as every face in this room. So my prayer for myself and for all of us is that we'll take that map and we'll leave the place where it's easy and sweet to describe the gate and we'll follow the path to the gate that waits for us, both when it is sweet There is only one gate, and there is only one voice. But we all have unique paths to get there. image of Mary. This ceremony reminds us that the greatest in the kingdom are those who serve with love. Our Lord himself came to serve and not to be served, and Our Lady was the humble servant of the Lord when she was on earth. Now, in the glory of heaven, she is still the God-bearer who cares about our salvation. She is the minister of holiness and queen of love. Lord, we bless you, for you are full of mercy and justice. You humble the proud and exalt the lowly. You gave us the highest example of your divine wisdom in the ministry of the Word in flesh and of his virgin child. Your Son, humbled by death, rose glorious at your right hand, the King of all creation. The Virgin, who acknowledged herself to be a servant, became the mother of our Redeemer. Reborn in her son, now raised above the angels, she prays for all, the queen of mercy and grace. Bless us as we crown this image of the mother of your son. We confess Christ to be king of creation and call upon Mary our queen. May we walk in your likeness, spending ourselves for the sake of others, content with our place in this life. May we one day hear your voice inviting us to take our place in heaven and receive the crown of victory. Lord have mercy. Christ have mercy. 
Christ have mercy. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. Christ hear us. Christ graciously hear us. So the Father of heaven have mercy on us. So the Son, Redeemer of the world have mercy on us. On us. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us. Holy Virgin of Virgins, pray for us. Mother of Christ, pray for us. Mother of the Church, pray for us. Mother of Divine Grace, pray for us. Mother Most Pure, pray for us.
all the friends and benefactors, all of you who've come out this day. Certainly special thanks to our director of music, Linda Sarabona, and all the seminarians and musicians who guide us not only today, but every year in our beautiful liturgies. And especially on this day, to thank the members of the Confraternity of Our Lady. It's a group of seminarians who lead us throughout the year in our Marian devotions and really help keep our hearts focused on our patroness, the Blessed Mother. And please, let me just say, this campus is open to you every day of the year. So after today, come on your own, bring your family, friends, altar servers, parish groups. We always welcome you to this place. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Bow down for the blessing. Through the motherhood of Mary, God in his goodness has chosen to redeem the human race. May he enrich you with his blessing. Amen. Amen. May you always and everywhere experience the protection of Mary, through whom you have received the author of life. Amen. May you who have come here today out of devotion take away with you the gift of joy in your hearts and the rewards of heaven. Amen. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Regina Cheney, Regina Alleluia, we are Alleluia, Alleluia.